Thanks very much, Jackie. It's really nice having you introduce me. Um, I also do want to thank all the sponsors for pulling this event together and, and uh, inviting me up to Vancouver again. It's always wonderful to be back here and makes me think of how can I become a Canadian. <laughs> um, I'm only half joking about that. Um, and especially I want to thank Irene McInnes. I met Irene um, when I was actually still living in Anchorage. She came up to, give, uh, to show footage and photos and give a talk on what was happening happening in Iraq uh, during the sanctions period. And it was at St. Mary's Church on Lake Otis and Tudor in Anchorage. And I remember that it was a sunny, sunny Sunday afternoon, if I remember the right, uh, correctly. And it was uh, during the build up to the war with Iraq. And that presentation impacted me deeply. And just seeing the footage and seeing inside the hospitals and, and seeing the people. Um, that certainly played a part in, in my deciding to go. So um, it's wonderful that we've stayed in touch and that you've helped me come up to Vancouver again. So thanks a lot, Irene. Um, and I also want to thank Lillian Karnuk uh, for uh, letting me stay in your uh, wonderful apartment. Uh, it's a lovely place, and thanks for putting me up. And now it gets depressing. <laughs> um, when we to talk about Iraq, I, I, tonight I basically want to do um, a few things. One, talk about uh, very briefly why I did decide to go, and then talk about what's happening on the ground right now in Iraq. Because specifically at this time, we're in the midst of a pretty amazing propaganda campaign uh, that uh, is basically telling people, yeah, things are better in Iraq. Things are better. Even people are coming back to their homes in Baghdad and this sort of thing. And so I, I want to go into some greater detail about what specifically is happening on the ground in Iraq today and why the situation uh, is uh, where it is exactly. Um, and I, I want to read a little bit from the book. I promise, promise not to read to you too much, and I'll, I'll definitely be doing more talking. But uh, especially with this audience, if, if I won't spend a lot of time talking about why the U.S. invaded Iraq. I, I imagine that the common denominator in this audience is, is high enough that I don't need to spend too, too much time on that, um, particularly in light of the fact that we have this interesting phenomena happening in the United States today that um, generals, uh, high-ranking generals, very high-ranking generals that uh, are now retiring, and I think there's about seven or eight now that have retired, kind of almost become um, like a trend or this kind of fatty thing to do for these high-ranking generals to retire and then become critical of the war or how the invasion was run or how the occupation is being run or, or of the Bush administration itself as Ricardo Sanchez was doing just a couple of months ago. And it's, it's interesting because these generals retire and then all of a sudden this phenomena happens and their testicles drop and then they start lashing out, and they find this courage, and they start lashing out at the administration. Um, and, and I always ask myself, well, if you really believe that so much, then why did you keep doing what you were doing before you retired? But anyway, that aside, the, the latest addition to the Newfound Testicle Club is <laughs> former CENTCOM Commander General John Abizé. Um, he's now part of the Hoover Institute, otherwise known as a very conservative think tank. It's Stanford University. It's also referred to as uh, Bush's brain trust. And um, so big shocker, John Abizade has a gig uh, with Hoover Institute now. And he was speaking there at Stanford uh, the middle of this past October about the Iraq war. And he said, quote, uh, for anyone who's still in doubt uh, what this war was about, of course it's about oil. We can't really deny that. We've treated the Arab world as a collection of big gas stations. Our message to them is, guys, keep your pumps open, prices low, be nice to the Israelis, and you can do whatever you want out back. And then a little bit later, on October 31st, when he was speaking at Carnegie Mellon University, Abizade told the audience that it may well be 50 years before the United States leaves the Middle East, in case there's any doubt. But I, I do want to back up and, and take us back to really the launching of the PR campaign um, to sell the Iraq war idea to the American public and to the rest of the world. 
and I want to take us back to September 6, 2002 to do this because it was on that day that the then White House Chief of Staff, Andrew Card, when speaking about the PR campaign for the Iraq War, told reporters in public, quote, from a marketing point of view, you don't introduce new products in August. I didn't, with few exceptions, I didn't see much mainstream media ire raised about this statement at all. I mean, a White House Chief of Staff talking about a PR campaign and war in the same sentence. But launch a PR campaign for war is exactly what he did because literally on the very next day, on September 7, 2002, George Bush and Tony Blair stood together at Camp David and declared that they had evidence from a United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency report that showed that Iraq was six months away from building nuclear weapons. The problem was, no such IADA report ever existed, but we know that. But now I want to play a little trick, just let's su suspend reality for a moment and pretend that we had legitimate journalism in the establishment media, and, and we're, we're back at September 7, 2002, so just pretend that all the big newspapers, all the big TV stations have legitimate journalists really doing their job really digging for the facts, really holding the, the centers of power to account for the claims that they make and the things that they do, and that Bush and Blair make this outrageous statement claiming they have that evidence from a UN IAEA report that actually doesn't exist. So in this world of legitimate journalism, we would assume then the next day, for example, the on perhaps the most uh, reputable newspaper in the United States, the New York Times, uh, certainly the most prestigious, that the front page story should have been, the lead story should have been something like Bush and Blair cite a report as evidence that actually doesn't exist. Something along these lines should have been the story because I, as a mountain climber in Anchorage, Alaska, using the internet to read UN weapons inspectors reports, Le Monde, Le Monde Diplomatique, The Independent, The Guardian, um, basically anything except U.S. mainstream media news, I knew when they said that, that it was bogus. And I would imagine that most of you in this room probably knew that too. But um, nevertheless, the very next day, instead, okay, so let's go back to reality. No, no legitimate journalism, with few exceptions in the establishment media. And the very next day on September 8, 2002, the uh, lead story in the New York Times, co-authored by none other than Judith Miller and Michael Gordon of WMD Notoriety, Michael Gordon of course still writing for the Times, uh, and they proudly quoted their favorite source, anonymous Bush administration officials, <laughs> as, as saying, quote, Iraq has stepped up its quest for nuclear weapons and has embarked on a worldwide hunt for materials to make an atomic bomb. And a little bit more uh, about the way this propaganda system worked, and, and, and this has all come out now. Um, this, is, this is not me breaking any new information. Uh, it's, it's very well known, especially at least in journalism circles. But the way that this worked, for example, Judith Miller, very prominent journalist with the New York Times, has security clearance at the Pentagon. She's regularly going into the Pentagon, being fed this information by her anonymous Bush administration officials. She's coming back to the Times, writing this up. The story runs on September 8th, on the um, literally the same day, Cheney goes on national television claiming Iraq is six months away from getting nuclear weapons. Look, even the New York Times is reporting this. And so it went over and over and over for months and months and months, and watching that happen before my very eyes, uh, that for me was my red line. That's when my red line got crossed. I was completely outraged at what I was seeing and felt that uh, um, the stakes had to be upped a bit if, if anything was going to change. And so that was when my red line got crossed and I decided to go to Iraq. And I, I would argue that the coverage is... is